In my book and in my presentation today, which I'll do my best to keep to the allotted time, I want to make three key points. The first point I want to make is that there are a number of cognitive and operational biases that have been observed over the years in foreign aid that have been repeatedly shown to be at odds with the world we live and work in, but which continue to exert a massive and undue influence on what we do, why we do it, how we do it, and how we report on it. The second point I want to make is that many of the problems we face today in development can be rather better understood using tools, ideas, and mindsets from the broad field of complex adaptive systems research. And finally, I want to conclude by arguing that complex systems thinking has a considerable and increasingly proven relevance for the work we do in aid in terms of busting enduring assumptions, which are flawed, and helping to develop and put in place more relevant ones. I also want to talk briefly about territorial approaches in the context of complex systems approaches, highlight some of the positives about the approach and some of the questions we might still need to ask as a donor community. But I want to start with a, with a parable. It's quite a well-known parable about a man who's walking home one dark and foggy night. And as he makes his way through the murk, he ne nearly trips over someone calling around by a lamppost. What are you doing? asks the traveller. I'm looking for my keys, replies the other. Are you sure you lost them here? asks the traveller. I'm not sure at all, replies the, comes the reply, but if I haven't lost them near this lamppost, I don't stand a chance of finding them. <laughs> now, I want you to keep this image, this, this parable of complexity, if you will, as in your mind as we go through the presentation. Now, I think we all know, don't we? I think we all know that there's a widespread and persistent bias in aid in general and in rural development efforts in particular. Aid institutions strongly incentivize the use of certain kinds of language, certain mindsets, certain assumptions, and certain approaches to describe and explain what we, in development agencies, what we want to do and what we do. And this applies even to tremendous successes and in the face of the available evidence. What we, what we do, essentially, is act as if the world around us, the uh, natural systems that we're exploiting, Agricultural systems, societies, the world as a whole, are analogous to a series of wind-up clocks or car engines. This kind of me beautifully mechanical world, a kind of Newtonian model, if you like. We act, we're incentivized to act, as if we can predict and precisely manage the behavior of these systems by breaking them up into manageable pieces and working on these pieces individually. And the role of aid managers and aid leaders is to engineer and construct change through reductionist analysis, through prediction, planning and control. And these assumptions underpin large amounts of what the formal aid system tries to do, whether it's rural development efforts, long-term long -term statewide reconstruction efforts, governance processes, large-scale global health programs. And what this actually amounts to is a, a number of implicit assumptions within the model which add up to a series of institutional and operational biases. And specifically, we tend, we're incentivized to look at agricultural systems, social systems, economic systems, as if they're closed, ordered, and reducible, that we can focus on the things we're most interested in while everything else is held constant, and that these systems are nothing more than the sum of the parts that we're interested in. We tend to think about individuals, institutions, and entities as if they're independent and atomized, that their most important characteristics are to be found at the individual level, and that the context and the relationships between those actors are irrelevant or ahistorical. Importantly, it can be rewritten, reshaped by external actors. We think about humans as rational, as based, making decisions based on self-interest, and that those best behaviours can be specified and reoriented by essentially changing the elements of this elaborate internal calculus. And we assume that change is linear, additive, that there's a simple cause and effect that there's a proportional relationship between inputs, outputs, and outcomes. So more inputs should lead to more outcomes. It's a world of single line graphs and x, y relationships. Now these ideas are not useful, uh, are not unuseful. These are not useless. They have their origins in 19th century science, in physical sciences, and they found their way into our institutions through scientific management and through ideal bureaucracies of the same period of, of uh, late 19th century, early 20th century capitalism bureaucracies. So th these are the kinds of assumptions that Henry Ford used to deliver any color car as long as it was black. And so unsurprisingly, they're most useful. These pr principles work brilliantly 
in situations where machines work well. They work well, they're ideal when there's a straightforward task to perform, a stable context, a stable operating environment, identical duplicable products, and compliant, predictable, reliable parts, including the human components. So I'd just like to have a show of hands. Who thinks their working environment resembles this in any way? Let alone the environment that they operate in developing countries. The reality is, and I'm not the first person to say this, these assumptions have proved spectacularly bad as ma uh, matching up to the realities of rural development. But these are exactly the assumptions that have underpinned many of the failures in rural development over the years, from integrated rural development of the 1970s through to technological transfer approaches in the 1980s. And indeed, these same approaches continue to shape what we might call big aid, uh, whether we're talking about global education initiatives, low co cost package of inputs designed and promoted by the Millennium Campaign as the key to achieving the MDGs. The harsh reality of the, of the Millennium Village projects as recently described by Nina Monk. So this is an illusion which the aid counter bureaucracy, as Andrew Natsios of USAID memory called it, demands be maintained in the face of the evidence. What Natsios talked about was this, the fact that measurability is inversely proportional to development relevance. And he was able to say this, having overseen the largest introduction ever of results-based management in a, in a major donor agency. He was able to say it after he left that organization. The question comes then, why can't people in power acknowledge this when they're in power? And it's a question I think we, maybe we can come back to. What I observe from my work in the field is that the frustrations with this model are running at fever pitch, whether you're talking about donor organizations, NGOs, the UN agencies, national governments that are trying to spend development money. And in the face of these failures, the model is being applied ever harder. We're trying to do the wrong thing righter. And everyone in aid now is talking about the outmoded business model of aid. And I would argue that this set of assumptions, this uh, neo-Newtonian model, is at least in part what they're referring to. I'm not saying, by the way, that any individual believes this that any one of us have this idea of, you know, we'll go out there and fix the clockwork, or that any organisation explicitly states it as part of their modus operandi. It's more that these ideas are hardwired into the institutions of aid. We spend so much time talking about the institutions in developing countries, we very seldom look at our own institutions. I think people do remarkably creative and innovative work, but they often do this in spite of the institutions they work in, rather than because of them. So in rural development, in the face of this mismatch between what you might describe as institutionalized reductionism and complex reality, there's a long history of doing the wrong thing writer. And actually, this is what we see in rural development is precisely what psychologists and behavioral scientists predict happens in situations where there's cognitive dissonance. We've done what people always do when the world doesn't match their mental models, when they're powerful incentives to maintain these models regardless. We try and make the world fit our viewpoint. We try and do the wrong thing righter. And there's evidence of this across rural development, just as there, in, in, as there is in aid as a whole. So how do we do this? We try and narrow the problem. We might try and focus on agricultural activities, despite the importance of non-farm employment. We might try and ignore the rural-urban linkages. We may take little consideration of macroeconomic <coughs> factors. We may pay ever more faith, put ever more faith into silver bullets. We pay little attention to the behavioral or political dimensions of changes. We assume that a technical transfer focused enough. We try to be more targeted, more focused, so that we action, our actions are narrowly focused on the very poorest, not considering the broader networks, the relationships, and the diversity of actors and the multiple dimensions we need to be operating across. We wish power away. We, we make actions in a different locations without thinking about the connectedness, the incentives people have to change, the heterogeneity of those incentives. And we ignore real world dynamics. We might use resources to compensate for market failures and then be absolutely staggered when they, those failures reappear after funding stops. We may not take account, as Bruno and uh, Julio talked about earlier, of the time needed to really make change. So it's probably worth reminding you of the parable of the man under the lamplight at this stage. This is a perfect analogy for what I call our addi addiction to reductionism. So in this regard, I'd say the aid sector resembles Duncan Watts' memorable quip, likening the Newtonian model to a Shakespearean character staggering across the global stage. 
So the, the question is, if it is mortally wounded, if we know it's flawed, why, why does it still persist? Given that every generation of aid critiques have come up with some version of this problem, from Albert Hirschman in the 1960s, Rodden Lenley in Chambers in the 1980s, Easterly in the noughties, why does this model refuse to die? In part, I think there are a number of development problems. You could argue it's a diminishing minority that are amenable to exactly these assumptions and approaches. But I think a more fundamental reason, to paraphrase Keynes, maybe it may well be better for individual, bureaucratic, and institutional reputation and status to fail conventionally within the context of this model, within the safe confines of, of the lamplight, if you like, than to succeed unconventionally by moving beyond it. And I think the reason this is so important is if we continue with this addiction to reductionism, if we continue with this, this model shaping what we do, we risk learning the wrong lessons from our successes and not learning at all from our failures. So let me move on now to the second part of my presentation and my argument. And the obvious reality is that development in humanitarian problems and the world at large are not like Newtonian clockworks. They're not like Ford motor cars. And growing numbers of experts are pointing to the ideas of complex adaptive systems as an alternative theoretical model. And this is what I want to explore now. And there's a history to these ideas, which I want to introduce you to. Some of you may be familiar with it. But it helps us grasp how and why they're important. And the seeds of the new complexity movement, uh, as it was then, and maybe to some people still is now, were sown actually 60 years ago by Warren Weaver. And he was the scientific vice president of the Rockefeller Foundation. And in my eyes, he's a forget forgotten giant of 20th century research. He personally funded the... Uh, um, through Rockefeller, the, the development of penicillin, anti-aircraft development, uh, all kinds of agricultural research programs, did a huge, uh, mentored over 20 Nobel laureates, but actually you won't see much about him in the science, uh, history of 20th century science. So I tell his story in full in the book, but basically Weaver found himself in a position not dissimilar to many modern donors. He was trying to think through the kinds of problems his foundation should address. And he was a true polymath. He was a mathematician, a social scientist. Uh, he, did, he was decorated by Canada and America and France and during the war for his work on anti-aircraft systems. Uh, so he was very well placed to try and understand a whole range of different systems. And what he observed was this significant gap in the activities of the foundation and the activities of the scientific community as a whole. He argued that there were three categories of problems in science, and there'd been much more progress on dealing with two of these than on the third. First of all, he talked about organized simplicity problems. These are problems of a few variables. For example, the trajectories of a rocket, Newtonian mechanics. Uh, these are the kinds of principles that underpin many of the advances of the industrial era, from transportation to many forms of basic health provision, and indeed, I'd argue, the aid industry. Now, what he argued was having dealt with problems of that kind, of organized simplicity, kind of up to the end of the 19th century, science then kind of leapt to the other extreme and started to deal with problems of disorganized complexity, systems with many variables, all interacting in random fashion. So the, the motion of atoms, the thermodynamics, statistical mechanics, population studies, uh, actuarial analyses, the kinds of things insurance companies do in order to analyze population risks and turn a profit. And what he identified was in between the two were problems of organized complexity. And these were pro problems which related to systems with a sizable number of factors they're interrelated into an intricate organic whole where we can't meaningfully boil them down to one or two variables. We can't get a straight line graph to describe these things. Uh, neither can we meaningfully apply averages. We can't apply statistical things. So commodity prices or child development or education levels in a country or economic development or the growth of cities or social change or mass social movements. And I think this is partly in part what Bruno alluded to when he talked about the limits of existing statistical approaches earlier on when, in terms of their, their ability to describe the diversity of, of development across the country. What Weaver argued was that scientists and policymakers and funders had put far more time and effort into the first set of first two, the organized simplicity and disorganized complexity, and relatively little into the latter. And he saw this as a paradox. He, he argued that almost all of the challenges we would face in the latter half of the 20th century, remember he was writing in 1948, would be of this third variety. And he called for a third great advance, which would combine multi multidisciplinary working with the power of what he rather touchingly called advanced counter machines, computers essentially, to better understand and navigate these problems. 
So where does that leave us? I think, I think actually there's a number of people, there's a number of uh, experts that would argue that we live in a world dominated by complex adaptive systems with exactly the characteristics that we've described. They're complex in that they're many interacting agents and organizations of agents. They're adaptive in that the individuals of those agents design strategies and they evolve over time. And they're systems in the sense that macro patterns emerge from micro behavior. You can't simply say this is happening at the base level and therefore that adds up to the, the overall system. And there, there are huge numbers, there's huge amount of evidence to show that the range of systems around us exactly map onto this kind of model. So ecological and agricultural systems are complex and the costs of treating them as simple machines are all around us. The climate is clearly complex and non-linear. The economy is complex at national and at global level. Energy is complex if you look at the North American electrical grid or increasingly the UK system. Food information systems, information systems, communities, societies, organisations, so they can all be usefully seen as complex systems. So this, this leaves us with a challenge. How do we steer a path between irrelevant or damaging reductionism on the one hand and holistic paralysis in Julia Hillier's memorable phrase earlier on the other? If we're going to invest in understanding <laughs> and navigating complexity, what kinds of approaches should we be thinking about? What I found is that by identifying uh, the distinguishing features of social, political and economic complex systems, we can start to get a handle on the problems within them. And there are four main areas of systems, networks, behaviours and dynamics, and I want to talk through these briefly. So systems thinking is the title given to this talk, but it's just one of the family of approaches we can use. And it enables us to think about systems that are not reducible to a few variables of interest, where we can take a wide angle lens on the problems that we're dealing with and understand how they're shaped by feedback and interdependence. It also enables us to be, think about the networks between peoples, groups, communities, to understand the underlying structures of social, economic and political relationships and how they change over time. We can be much more realistic about behaviours, how behaviours evolve, how we think about and make decisions individually and collectively, and how they're shaped by our incentives. And finally, it sheds light on real-world dynamics, which are non-linear and shaped by surprise and by tipping points. And these are all broad approaches for analysing and better understanding and navigating complex systems. And if we compare these to the mo kind of assumptions we were talking about earlier, what well, is I think it's clear to see that these present a systematic and coherent alternative to the modus operandi, the, the standard operating models of aid that I talked about earlier. Now, I think it's actually really important to say these ideas are not new to rural development. So principles from systems thinking, from dynamic approaches, from complexity theory, have played a role in agricultural research and development for at least the last two decades. Now, this is a quote from Robert Chambers in writing in 1990 that complexity and diversity were underperceived and therefore undervalued in agricultural sciences. And from around that time, we've seen a growth in a whole range of new alternative approaches. And this is from work that was done by the Future Agriculture Consortium a few years back, and it's probably too small for you to see, but it essentially shows the evolution of agricultural uh, research uh, from the 1970s, talking about transfer of technology, farming systems approaches, farmer first and farmer participatory research, and through to more recent uh, focus on agricultural innovation systems. And what this, what this really usefully shows is how this is underpinned by growing awareness of exactly these principles that I've been talking about. And I'd recommend everyone kind of, uh, there's a paper which you can download online and, and take a look at, at this work, and their work on political economy approaches more generally, which I'll come back to. And yet, despite this kind of general evolution over time, the same colleagues at the Future Agricultural Consortium highlighted a couple of years ago this point, that despite successful cases, despite uh, a lot of uh, innovation uh, applications and so on, the, uh, what this amount is a series of limited add-ons, bolt-ons to the existing model. So it may have enabled technology transfers to be a bit more scientific and a bit more evidence-based, but essentially th this, this, this idea of a more transformative change inspired by systems thinking and complexity thinking hasn't really come to fruition yet. And there's a lot more work to be done in terms of bringing these ideas to bear on the reality of how we work in rural development. So let me move on now to talk about how these ideas can tangibly be applied to the way uh, we work in rural development. Now in the, in the book, there are over 25 case studies across these different areas, systems, behaviours, networks and change. 
of aid which tried new ways of thinking, of new ways of working, and which have led to dramatically improved results. Um, and I think in the context of the book which I've written, what I've observed is more direct application of these methods. Not just the principles, which is what we saw in the 1990s, but people actually using these tools and techniques, uh, using their, their kind of computational power, their data-driven power, and building awareness of just how powerful these approaches can be. And I think there's, there was this kind of tendency within development, it may be there in other settings as well, to see data-driven approaches as kind of belonging and quantitative approaches belonging to the, the kind of top-down model and participatory pr approaches belonging to the bottom-up model. And actually what I've found in the case studies of the book, they all kind of fuse these two ways of thinking to crack long-standing issues. And, and these have been driven, or this kind of fusion has been driven by computing power, the availability of data, but also new social technologies to enable uh, participation and dialogue. There's also been some very vocal advocates across the sector in development. Um, so uh, Jim is here, and he, before he joined uh, Australia, he, uh, the Australian government, he did a lot of work to bridge the gap between what the private sector was doing in complexity thinking with Dave Snowden and the work of Cognitive Edge and what we in the development sector are doing. So I think that there's, there's been a number of people who've been trying to do exactly that kind of bridging work. And I, I guess the thing to say is, you know, uh, what I've been able to do is synthesise their experiences and their ideas into the book. So really, it, it's a very collective enterprise. But I guess it, um, we, we haven't got much time. And I, so what I want to do is give a couple of examples to illustrate this way of thinking, one of which fits into the behavioural approach, one of which fits into the network, networks approach, and both of which have a lot of relevance for rural development and for the territorial approach. So the first one I want to talk about is around adaptive evolutionary methods. Um, quick show of hands, who here rides a bicycle? Um, great, thank you. Keep your hands up if you think you can design a bicycle from scratch. Anyone? Okay, obviously it's a trick question. This is how the bicycle came into being. Poly uh, essentially, the bicycle evolved. It wasn't a case of anyone sitting down and saying, this is the problem we have, we're going to solve it in a top-down way and we'll reach the... I don't have a pointer here. Oh, okay. We'll reach that, that kind of model there. Actually, it evolved through adaptive tinkering. It wasn't a rational maximization approach that led us to the kind of models we now have for bicycles. And, and this is a, maybe a rather crude analogy, but actually the reality is policy and practice, like all forms of technology, like bicycles, like the things that ride bicycles, like life itself, come into being through processes of adaptation, learning, and adjustment. And institutions, too, evolve through these processes of adaptive tinkering. And therefore, our responses to poverty, deprivation, to the kinds of political decisions that we need to make at the local level, should also be adaptive in their scope and their delivery. Less Newtonian, more Darwinian. And, and one of the case studies I look at in the book acknowledges and harnesses the adaptive power of poor people in their decision-making processes. It's called companion modelling. And it was developed by Francois Bousquet and a community of French development researchers working at CIRAD over the past 15 years. And ComMod, as it's known for as short, emerged from this heightened awareness of the limitations of these existing analytical and policy research techniques. And they saw the need to respond to understand the dynamics of decision making in rural settings, especially in relation to the natural resource management, and to inform ways of resolving conflicts through effective processes of mediation. And it was actually based on the fact that in rural development, as much attention needed to be paid to the social and political dynamics of managing resources as to the ecosystem dynamics, precisely because working solutions emerge from the interactions between di diverse stakeholders. And I think this relates to the human interaction aspects that Mark was talking about this morning. So the ComMod is based on the idea that combining participatory role-playing games amongst poor villages and rural farmers can be combined with computer simulations in order to generate better insights about how to shape policy and how to shape practice. And what they essentially end up doing was identifying the ways in which different people made decisions about resources. So this is one particular example in Bhutan around water management. And they tried to understand the way in which pe uh, different people shared water uh, and, and understand that the points at which they're in Bhutan is obviously a very traditional society and there are all kinds of uh, traditional principles which governed which villages and which villagers got to access water. 
And having identified the principles that shape that, they, they developed games. They developed role-playing games that put people into new situations, new scenarios, flood situations, or, or periods where there was less water, to try and get them to talk through how they would act given their existing models. And then what they did was they modelled this using computer games, using simulations, and did this in a participatory way. So they actually got illiterate farmers that had never seen a computer before engaging with and you can see the laptops down here at the bottom, engaging with how to build models. And, and they did this, this process with them. And by bringing these two different approaches together, they were then able to simulate the kinds of situations and provide the villagers themselves with ways of understanding how this problem would evolve over time. And, and importantly, for territorial approaches, they, they were able to take on board spatial dimensions because different people have different priorities and different incentives in different areas. But you might describe this as modelling 2.0. And they saw some remarkable successes in, ter in terms of strengthening our understanding of these bottom-up processes of decision-making amongst natural resource users, and using this as a means of designing new rules or institutions to enhance decision-making processes. And there's some great examples of doing this, uh, water management in Bhutan and rice in Vietnam or land use in Senegal. And this, so this is what you might call practical policy econ uh, political economy as applied to agricultural research. Um, and the same basic principles were used by the World Bank in looking at their macro reform processes across five Asian countries. So it's applicable across broader scales too. The, the next approach I want to talk about, of the, t of the four I'm just going to talk about too, is network analysis. And this is based on the idea that formal relations hide more than they reveal. And if we look at the informal connections between actors, we can understand the relationships which actually govern how things are done. And all of us sitting in this room are dramatically uh, shaped, influenced, uh, guided by our social networks. And they're usually not depicted anywhere, but they're intricately intertwined in how we make decisions, what we think, our organizations, the way organizations perform, the way organizations develop strategy and innovate. And they also have a great deal to do with this. I mean, I know personally, my social networks have a great to do with to do with my kind of personal productivity, my learning, my career success, and so on. And, but it's not always easy to know what's going inside these groups. And this is a, an example of network analysis that was done in an exploration and production division of a large oil company. And there was a, essentially a decision to try and um, uh, reorganize, um, I guess is the kind of polite way of putting it, essentially cut back staff members across the senior management team within one particular division. What they were proposing was there's a line below coming across Sen, O'Brien, and Shapiro. And they said, OK, well, we, we basically think we can cut everyone below that line there. And um, because the organizational hierarchy implies that no one else is actually all that important and we can, we can outsource, we can find ways of replacing what they do. And the consultants that went in said, well, actually, who talks to who? Who matters in this organizational network? And what they identified when they went and asked this range of senior managers, just these same people, who are the most important people for your day-to-day -day work? They identified at the center of this social, and then mapped that using this graph method. They identified this individual, Cole, was actually at the center of the social network for the entire senior management team, even though she was only there in terms of the yeah, organizational hierarchy. So it revealed a striking contrast between the formal and informal structures, but you wouldn't know this without doing the analysis. And network analysis can be very helpful in terms of discerning these patterns of connectivity and different functions across organizations. And for this reason, it's been described as an organizational x-ray. Um, I've just been showing the five-minute card, so I'm going to go through this, uh, this, this case quite quickly. This is work that was led by MIT and Harvard, applying network analysis to, the, to essentially uh, the national economies. Um, it was led by Ricardo Hausmann, who's the former chief economist of the Inter-American Inter Development Bank. And they essentially formalized an approach of relatedness between products uh, being a fundamental, uh, uh, having a fundamental importance for the development of nations. And this is the, this is the, the kind of network map that they've developed. It's a project called the Atlas of Economic Complexity. And what they essentially identified is that there's a structure of productivity, that different products are related to each other. It was actually inspired by Ricardo's observations that uh, the production and export of asparagus in different countries in uh, South America also enabled artichoke farmers to scale up very quickly in those same countries. It's a very simple principle, but actually when you apply that across an economy as a whole, what you get are these maps of how different products are related to each other. 
And these aren't just relationships between products. These are relationships between the productive knowledge, the assets, the skills, the, the technologies within a country. In a sense, it's a, it's, a, it's a map of the productive capability of countries. And it applies to all different countries. So the, and what they've identified is that actually it can help explain all kinds of things, like why do rural development strategies in some countries like Ghana not work and why have they worked much more successfully in countries like Malaysia? One built its agricultural base in a much more bootstrapping way, building on agricultural development to generate industrial development, while the other didn't. And it's proved incredibly powerful, so it's actually a better predictor of economic growth than many of the other tools we have available. So it's 10 times more effective than the World Bank governance indicators, much more effective than the World Economic Forum growth indicators. And it also points to a different approach to thinking about growth. So you look to this existing network, you see the ways in which the network can be grown, and you try and foster that. You're less of an architect of change. You're not, not trying to pick winners. You're more of a gardener trying to facilitate this. And it can be applied across countries. Uh, the East Af African community recently used it to look at productive capabilities uh, across those different countries. But it also can it be used subnationally. So it, I think it gives an insight into the kinds of mosaics that Julio talked about, but also the map that Estrian talked about on Guinea to talk about different productive regions uh, within a country and to get a better sense of the relationships and the role of agriculture in this case versus other industries. But I think the real power is how, how it can be used to facilitate dialogue about the risks and opportunities facing countries, facing regions. So what do these approaches mean for the kinds of territorial approaches we've been discussing today? There was a 2010 paper uh, developed by a Dutch research institute uh, that essentially argued that complexity thinking has the potential to be a very important uh, substantiated underpinning for, the, for, um, uh, territorial, for the territorial paradigm. And uh, in my own initial uh, explorations, what I saw was some generic systems thinking approaches that are being used in um, uh, the territorial approach. For example, the nexus approach that was discussed uh, this morning by ADC. There was also a variety of spatial techniques of the kind that Julio and Bruno talked about. Uh, the focus on developmental is a fundamentally relational process. And there's some forms of dynamic analysis. But I think it's important to say that the territorial approach is actually a very broad church. And there are a number of uh, uh, people today, over the course of today, that have been telling me about territorial approaches that are indeed reductionist, blueprint, and uh, try and be very top-down in their take on things, even though this should go against the actual principles of uh, the core philosophy of the territorial approach. So what I would like to pose is, is four questions, really, of, of the territorial approach from a complexity perspective. So, so the first one is that the, there's this critique of rural agriculture efforts which underpin territorial approaches, and they echo the critique of aid made from a complexity perspective. But I think having made that approach, I think there's a risk that the territorial approach kind of falls back into the top-down, reductionist, silver bullet, sector-based kind of approaches. And I know at a research level we understand that this is not, we, uh, we shouldn't be doing this, but I, I think our institutions may well be pushing us to do that. So how do we avoid that? I think, I think while there is clear resonance between the principles of territorial approaches and the complex systems approach, I think the policy basis of territorialism, uh, territorial approaches may well have uh, started to go faster than the scientific basis. So how can we use complexity? How can we use these ideas of systemic, behavioral, network, and dynamic approaches to, to better inform the science of, of territorial approaches? I've seen some evidence of applying systems approaches of dynamic analysis, but what about behaviors? What about networks? Are we not, in a lot of the discussions this morning, I wanted to ask, are we not assuming a certain set of homogenous interests across a territory? What's the role for political economy? Uh, are we being too short-term? Are we being too project-focused, too unidimensional? And I think the final point is that uh, in agricultural research, in aid as a whole, there's lots of policy research, lots of academic research, lots of evaluative research. Is there enough operational research when we're talking about changing institutions? We tend to think about action research as something we do with farmers. But actually, if we're going to be serious about a territorial approach, we may need to be doing action research with policymakers. And that seems to be a bit more challenging thing to take on board. So let me, let me close with some reflections. I think the key thing to this area of work, if there's just one thing I want you to take away, is that there's a whole body of work around complex systems. There are people that are applying this in international development. And what they're trying to do is use new ideas to challenge and transform long-held and inappropriate assumptions. And you can see here I've presented these kind of 
the sciences of simplicity. These are what I would argue underpin a large amount of aid, certainly big aid. And then the ideas from the uh, complexity on the bottom. And this is essentially what I think complexity research brings. Whether we see this as a challenge or an opportunity, as a, you know, a, a route to holistic paralysis or, or as a route to intelligent, intelligent decision-making, I think it's ultimately up to us. I think it's important to say as well, I'm not saying complexity is a silver bullet. I'm not saying it's the only way to bust these assumptions. And I trained in anthropology, and you know, anthropologists say, and many social scientists say, we, we, we have ways of dealing with these things. But I think the important thing is it's one of the few ways that enables us to deal with all of these biases at the same time. And therefore, if we can take these, this paradigm, if you like, on board, it enables us to improve our way of thinking and working in aid, so that our approaches, our efforts, have much greater fidelity to the world. So the key isn't the unthinking and wholesale application. Now, I've talked about, the, I've given variants of this presentation about 15 times in the last two or three months since I launched the book. And there are all kinds of people out there that essentially say, oh, great, the world is complex, therefore fund my pet project that I've been talking about for ages. Or uh, the world is complex, therefore fund huge amounts of research on complex research, on complexity science. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is there are some problems where we need to apply exactly these kinds of approaches. And the simple models are exactly what we need. But when we're talking about things like territorial approaches, we need to acknowledge that actually the approaches, the assumptions we need to make are very different. And therefore, we need to be dealing with them as accordingly. We need to be able to apply these principles and ideas as well as we can. So let me return very briefly to a, a man groping under the light. For me, this is what complex systems is really about. It's a departure from past thinking. It's not merely an additional variable to consider. It's essentially about finding ways of moving beyond the lamplight of our institutions, of our individual comfort zones. But their colleagues at the Santa Fe Institute, where, which is kind of the spiritual home of complexity science, describe it as an engine for intuition. And I think that's actually what it's most useful for. They present ideas of how to think, new interpretive frameworks, new ideas and insights, a way of moving beyond this lamplight and exploring new, uh, new spaces, new approaches a way of illuminating the darkness, if you will, and giving us a way of navigating it. I want to leave you with this closing thought from someone who spent a lot of his time working beyond the lamplight. And I think this is probably the key message I want to close with. Thank you all for listening.